Well, you may know that uh, Larry has been working for many years in Uganda, training pastors, uh, training pastors up in areas where they don't have uh, Bible-believing presence. And today, we're going to start out with a scripture reading before our sermon, and we actually have the privilege of one of those pastors that's being trained. He's going to read our scripture today. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be a treat. Hear from. Good morning, faith community. I am Tabo Emmanuel Eli. I am serving as a uh, youth pastor in Amazing Grace Baptist Church, Yumbe, Uganda. And I live with my wife, with two children. Our scripture reading for today is taken from the book of John, chapter 6 verse 22 to 35, which is found in the page 891 in the Bible, which can be found in the chair in front of you. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the board with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boards from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor the disciples, they themselves got into the boat and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your full, I mean your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For... On him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they say to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they say to him, then... What sign do you do that we may see and believe you? Then what work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread for from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to, to the world. They say to him, Sir, Give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the word of the Lord. You guys never clap for me when I read the scripture. It's fine. If I had a cool accent, maybe you'd clap for me. Morning, everybody. Welcome. 
good to be with you today. My name is Tim, if we've never met before, and I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Community Church. I know uh, many of you are, are um, coming in today with a heavy heart um, because of the news uh, regarding uh, former President Trump this morning. It sounds like he's okay, uh, but if you hadn't heard, someone tried to shoot him yesterday. They're calling it an assassination attempt. Um, I, I just want to let you know before we start, we're going to take time at the end of our uh, gathering today to pray, uh, pray for him, pray for each other, and pray for the country, okay? Um, before we begin um, our teaching, though, I, I just want to say a word about, his name is Emma. Everybody calls him Emma, Tabu Emmanuel Ali Emma. Um, so I got to travel with um, Pastor Larry back in May to Uganda. Gar Christensen joined us as well. And uh, a couple of things I wanted to show. Everyone's, at, you know, asked me, well, how did it go? What'd you learn? A couple of things. One, all the stories Larry's been telling us for seven, eight years are true. That's one thing I took away. Uh, there really are, uh, you know, 80 or so men that are being trained to preach and teach the Word of God who really are planning churches in uh, places where they don't have a gospel witness. And I had assumed, and I've even talked about it this way, I had assumed that these are small groups of 20 or 30 meeting under a mango tree. I've even talked about it that way. And that's not what's going on. Uh, the congregation that we worshiped with while we were there was 200, 250 people, something like that. The other thing that surprised me, you may have noticed that Emma is a youth pastor. I thought that was kind of an American thing. Uh, but actually, just by show of hands uh, in the group that I was working with, a third of those guys are youth pastors. Uh, and, and part of the reason, I think, is because the congregations that I got to see and the guys I talked with, about half of their congregations are children. Actually, there's a guy named Edwin who planted a church three years ago in, in Ajumani. Ajumani is one of these internally displaced persons camps. Uh, he planted a church there three years ago, and he was telling me his church has 300 children, just kids. And so a third of the guys that, that we're training there are actually youth pastors, and they have the same uh, passion to see the next generation of Ugandan and Congolese and South Sudanese kids raised up for the Lord, just the way that we do here in the St. Croix Valley. So it's a very, very cool. And we're actually going to have several Ugandan scripture readers over the next month. And maybe, maybe with each one, I'll share just a, a little more with you. So thank you, uh, Faith Community Church. Thank you for your giving. Uh, I never get tired of saying that to you. And to be able to show you uh, something that is happening because of your prayers and because of your giving is just a real treat. So, All right. So our reading was in John chapter 6, page 891, as Emma said, which I would encourage you to have out in front of you, okay? Because we're, really we're just going to walk verse by verse through this today, and I would love for you to see uh, what I want to show you today. Uh, but John chapter 6, which we began two weeks ago, begins with these two really, really significant events. And they're significant, at least in the sense that uh, the first, this feeding of the 5,000 is one of the only stories that all four gospel writers give to us. And um, in it, so the, in the first story, it says that Jesus, knowing what he was about to do, if you look at verses five and six, knowing what he was about to do and to test his disciples came to them and said, where are we going to get bread to feed these 5,000 people? And if you were here, Jan said, that's just 5,000 men. So we're actually talking about around probably 20,000 people out in the wilderness. He says, well, how are we going to feed them? And so we learn lesson number one in this series. If you're going to follow Jesus, he is going to put you in situations that really are impossible. And he's going to put things in front of you to do that you genuinely do not have the resources to do. That's lesson number one. Then the next week, we read about how Jesus put his disciples into a boat and sent them into a storm. All this happens in about 10 hours. It's a busy day, okay? He, he puts his disciples into a boat and sends them into the storm and then comes to them walking on the water. This is one of those places where Jesus is teaching by what he does. That he is, he is the I am that I am. He, he is the God who treads upon the sea. And when you say yes to following him, you have no idea what you're getting into. And that's the second thing that we learn about following Jesus. Uh, that there is, you are biting off 
more than you think. So the question, just speaking personally for myself, the question hanging over the first two weeks of this series has been, do I really want that? If this is what following Jesus is, that he's going to deliberately put me in situations where I cannot do what he's asking me to do and then put me out into storms just so I can see him more clearly. Is that really what I want? And that's the question for us today as well. So our reading today says, verse 24, and all this will be on the screen if we can uh, get it, but our reading today says then that the crowd that remained behind got into boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And again, that's a mega theme in the Gospel of John. Remember the very first thing that Jesus says in the Gospel of John? Back to chapter 1, verse 28. What do you want? What are you seeking? That's the first thing Jesus says. Well, they're seeking Jesus, it says. And that first paragraph is just full of hustle. And confusion. The crowds wake up after this big feast. They wake up the next morning. Nobody can find Jesus. Verse 22 says, there was only one boat and everybody saw the disciples get in it without Jesus. And it says, more boats are arriving from Tiberias. Like people are coming, they're rowing across this huge lake to try to find Jesus. And there's confusion. So they all row to Capernaum. It's like back and forth, back and forth across this giant sea. They're looking for Jesus. And when they find him, this is verse 25, they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? Uh, In other words, what are you doing, man? Where'd you go? Like, you're over here. And we had this, like, plan, Jesus. We had this plan. We're going to make you king. And then you just disappear. And now you're, you know, welcome to following Jesus, everybody. I mean, how many times in your Christian life have you said, Jesus, like, we had this whole plan, man. (laughs) And I thought you were over here. And then you turn up over here. And you never consulted me. Like, what's going on? You know, this is following Jesus 101. And once again, Jesus demonstrates he always knows what's going on. And this is verse 20, verse 26 will be on the screen as well, but I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Okay, so you can read it and listen to how I'm going to paraphrase. It says, basically, Jesus says, listen, truly, truly, you are not looking for me because you saw signs. It's not like you saw this miracle in the wilderness and your curiosity has peaked now and you really want to know, well, who is this guy? You are here for lunch. That's what you want. We all had a great dinner last night and you have rode across the water because you want lunch. And then he gives them a warning and an invitation. And here's where we'll spend most of our time today. Verse 27. Do not work for the food that spoils. Work for the food that endures to eternal life. You are rowing all over the place and you got people coming across the lake now and everyone's worked up and confused. Don't do that anymore. Stop working for food that spoils and work for the food that endures to eternal life. And that's what we're going to talk about. Jesus uses a lot of metaphors to describe eternal life. Uh, In chapter 3, he says it's like being born again. You must be born again, he says. In chapter 4, he says it's like water. It's like a spring of water that wells up inside of you and it never runs out. And here we see in verse 27, it's the food that endures. In verse 32, it's bread from heaven. Verse 35, he calls it the bread of life. This is eternal life. What the metaphor points to, among other things, is the the vitality and the energy and the fullness that only Jesus can give. The new birth, uh, you must be born again, points to the radical nature of eternal life and to the grace of eternal life. The, The metaphor of water points to the necessity of eternal life. Like You cannot live for very long without water. And you must also have this eternal life. Well, bread points to the the energy and the fullness of the life that Jesus gives. Now, I know there are physiological issues with what I'm about to say. But listen, you can't run for a super long time on just water. You're not, if all you have is water, you're not going to grow. You're not going to change. You're not going to get stronger. There's no energy or vitality in just water alone. And the other thing is water, water will never really make you full. Okay. It'll make you bloated, but that's not only food 
fills you and stays with you. Do you know what I mean? And that's the life that Jesus says, I've come to give you. The other thing he's saying is that eternal life, the life of Jesus, is something that has to be taken in. Just like food, it has to enter into the core of our being. And when it does... When that life enters into the core of our being, it just releases all of this new growth and change and vitality and energy, and it satisfies. The life that Jesus brings satisfies and fills us. I am, he says, the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. We've mentioned this before, but just in case, maybe this is your very first time here at Faith Community Church or you just need a reminder. We have only one word in English for life. The Greeks had two words. There's bios, which just describes the biological functioning of your body. And then there's this word, it'll be on the screen as well, zoe or zoe. Anybody here named Zoe? You got a great name. Zoe. Is, is the Greek word to describe that sense of fullness and abundance and spiritual depth that goes way beyond just being alive. Okay, has anybody ever said with a deep sigh, oh, this is living. You ever said that? You ever had one of those moments? You're at the cabin and you're in the hot tub and you're staring over the lake and there's peace in your home. The kids are just thriving. Your wife thinks you are like the greatest thing that walks the earth. Your boss loves you at work, etc. And you say, oh, this is living. <laughs> this is living. Well, the, the, the Greeks would say, what you're experiencing in that moment is, is a superficial zoe. That intangible sense of, oh, yes. This is it. Now, I say superficial because you all know that scenario I just painted is not real. It never lasts. And as you're soaking, 50 emails just hit your inbox and they'll be there on Monday morning when you're done in the tub, right? And it's superficial because the life Jesus is talking about is life in the midst of the storm. Uh, it's the bread of heaven is a sense of fullness and peace and contentment when the cabin is on fire and your boss hates you and the hot tub is jetting brown goo. Just, it's an, the word that he uses is, is it's a life that endures. It's indestructible. And your circumstances don't change that sense of this is living. Do not work, he says in verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal zoe, eternal life. And whenever the Bible talks about eternal zoe, eternal life, it's never talking about life that just goes on forever. That is actually the definition of hell. Hell is a place where you're just alive forever. Hell is a place of eternal existence and Jesus has actually come to save you from that and what he brings is eternal zoe, eternal life, which is a growing sense of purpose and joy and vitality and fullness and peace that not only endures forever but will grow and grow and grow. In the Chronicles of Narnia stories, uh, Lucy uh, sees Aslan after many, many years after first meeting him. He, she runs into him again many years later and she says to Aslan, Aslan, you grew, you got bigger. And you remember Aslan says to her, yes, child, every year that you grow, I get bigger too. It's a picture of eternal life. That sense of peace, contentment, and joy, you are never going to get to the bottom of it. And it will just grow from age to age. And the, the, the astounding news of, this, of the gospel is that Jesus gives that life to us now. 
now. He really does give eternal life in the midst of this life, in the midst of these storms. And to be a Christian is to have it now. Not in its fullness, okay? But you're getting the down payment now. So why do we miss it? Why do we miss the life that Jesus brings? Well, there are at least two reasons in verses 27 through 31. Number one, we miss the bread of heaven because it's not the only bread on the market. He says, don't work for the food that perishes. There's more than one kind of bread on the market. Um, I'll illustrate it this way. Do the words little Debbie mean anything to you? (laughs) Okay. I judge by your response that you've heard of this. Do the words oatmeal cream pie mean anything to you? Oatmeal cream pie. We have some in our pantry right now. They're right at eye level. So they're the first thing you see when you open the doors to the pantry. Who knows how old they are? They could be 10 years old. You would never know because they never die, right? (laughs) It's basically poison masquerading as food. And um, they look so good. Especially, when do they look, when you've just finished a steak, does an oatmeal cream pie appeal to you? Probably not. But at two o'clock in the morning, when you can't sleep and you're up and you feel empty inside, they whisper to you. (laughs) Don't they? And they say, eat me. (laughs) I'm going to make you feel so good. I'm what you really want. And then you do. And what happens to you? You, f- you do feel good for about 15 minutes, and then the goodness passes, doesn't it? Literally and metaphorically, the goodness <laughs> is gone. Well, that is what Jesus is talking about in verse 27. Uh, we miss the bread of life because there are so many imitations on the market, things that whisper to us, especially when we're lonely and afraid and empty and needy and new relationships come along more square footage comes along uh, a new car comes I mean fill in whatever your oatmeal cream pie is it comes along to you at two in the morning and says oh if you just had me I'd fill you and you know that doesn't work that eventually it all just turns to that oatmeal cream pie. Ugh, it didn't work again. The second reason that we miss the bread of life uh, is harder to explain, but let's take a look at verse 27. So he says in verse 27, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Jesus is just saying there, that he's the only place this life of Zoe can be found. And then they said to him, verse 28, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who is sent. And so they said to him, look at this, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Ever just stop right there. What sign do you do? What work will you do that we might see and believe you? What are they even talking about? I mean, the whole reason they're having this conversation is because they just rode across a lake to find him because he'd fed 20,000 of them out in the wilderness. What do they mean by what are you going to do to prove yourself to us? This whole feeding of people in the wilderness was, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the fulfillment of messianic promises in the Old Testament. And they got that. That's why they were going to try to make him king. And now they're saying to him, hey, what are you going to do to prove it to us? What are they really saying there? They're saying what Christians say all the time, which is, yeah, we know who you are, but you've not fixed my problem. (laughs) Right? How many times do Christians say, yes, I believe in Jesus, but I am a miserable wreck. I hate my life. I hate how it's going. They're there because they're saying to Jesus, yeah, you're the one, but we're still hungry. And then they go on to tutor him in Messiahship. They, in, verse, in the next verse, they point to Messiah like Jesus needs some pointers maybe. And they say, hey, you know, Jesus, 
our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it's written, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And the implication there, right, is, oh, and by the way, Jesus, he did it every day, right? He fed them every day in the wilderness. Why do we miss the bread from heaven? Because Jesus is talking about something, a kind of fullness and satisfaction in life that just goes so far beyond what we call living. Uh, we miss it because we can't even, we don't even know what he's talking about. We don't even know what it means to be full. I've been saying the bread of life makes us full, awake, content. We don't even know what that means because we're born empty, numb, and weary. We don't even have categories for what Jesus has promised to us. Eternal life now, life in the spirit, the daily experience of union with Christ so that we walk around with a sense of I'm not alone and God is present with me and leading me. I was thinking this week, how would I describe to my 13-year-old self what I am talking about now? When I was 13, I really believed and lived as though basketball were the I Ching of life. I mean, the sum of all goodness and being. This week I've been thinking, how would I explain to my 13-year-old self, you have no idea what you're talking about. It's like trying to describe a sunset down at the river to a blind person. How would you do that? We, the only way to find out what Jesus is talking about is to follow him. And that's what I'm here to plead with you to do today. The only way you can know what Jesus is saying here is to follow him and then to keep following him and to hold fast to him as he holds fast to you and let him lead you into storms. Let him lead you out into impossible situations. We just want the storms to end while Jesus is trying to say, I brought you here because I am, I'm trying to show you a kind of life you can't even imagine at this point. Jesus responds to them in verse 32. He says, first of all, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father did that. And then second, the father has once again sent bread from heaven, only this time it's true bread. What he's saying there is that that whole story in Exodus about manna coming down from heaven was about him, a preview of him. Uh, think about the manna. In the story of Exodus, it was mysterious. It seemed to come out of nowhere. It was good. It was satisfying. It was hard to describe. You ever read the Old Testament trying to describe the manna? They're like, well, it was kind of like this, but it was kind of like that, but it's not like any of that. <laughs> you know? Ever read it? Hard to describe. And it sustained them in the wilderness. It didn't take them out of the wilderness any more than Jesus is going to take you out of your wilderness, but it sustained them every day and filled them up. And that whole story, Jesus says, is a preview of what I, am, I will do for you. It's a picture of him. The manna, the manna in the wilderness was in miniature what Jesus goes on to say, I am for the whole world. He says in verse 33, for the bread of heaven is he. It's he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Mysterious, hard to describe, but good and satisfying and always there. And they say to him in verse 34, the first smart thing they say, sir, give us the bread. Give us this bread. Always. The only way to know what Jesus is talking about 
will be to follow him. I cannot describe it to you beyond that. You need to say yes to following him and yes to everything that he'll lead you into. Sir, they say, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Christianity is the most personal religion in the world. It is the most personal religion in the world. The, the bread of heaven is he. It's he who came down from the Father. The bread of life is Jesus himself. And whoever would come to him, he says, will never be hungry again. Christianity is the most personal religion in the world. You know, it's helpful if, if you're, oh, how do I describe it? it it's a, if you're a super smart intellectual person this morning, and you, you need deep philosophy, you will find it there with Jesus, but it's never ultimately about that. If you're a person this morning who is longing for that profound mystical experience, you will find that in Jesus, but it is never really ultimately about those experiences. The bread of life is he who came down from heaven. And unless your religion is radically personal, you have not understood Christianity yet. This is a, uh, an extended quote from Tim Keller. And in it, he provides a number of questions and tests that we can ask ourselves. I want to share this with you now. He says, every Christian I know admits that before they were converted, either they had no relationship with God at all, or they had a business relationship. If you can't remember a time in your life when you had no relationship with God or you had a business relationship, you are not a Christian. Because a Christian is someone who's moved out of where you were into having a personal relationship. It doesn't matter if you were raised in religion. It doesn't matter if you were raised in a Christian home. There's a place at which your relationship has to become personal. It stops being a matter of just you suing God for breach of contract every so often, you making demands and saying, look, I'm doing my part. Why haven't you done yours? Here are some examples. Do you find that he's constantly teaching you new things? Are new truths dawning on your heart? Can you tell me something new he's been teaching you this month? Do you sense his love shut abroad in your heart? Do you get together with him just to get together with him? Do you find that he reaffirms his love for you constantly and you reaffirm your love for him? In hard times, does he give you peace? Can you feel him supporting you and sustaining you? Does he communicate with you? Are you willing to rearrange your life to show him that he has priority? Because after all, look. Look at how he rearranged his life to show you what you meant to him. Do you have a personal relationship or is Jesus just a set of rules or something else? That's our question this morning. Does Jesus truly sustain your life like manna in the wilderness? Do you feed on him in your heart the way that you would bread? Could you identify things now that God has been teaching you in the last month? Growing you, teaching you to follow him, exposing your unbelief. Do you still find your soul saying, Yes, but it's all worth it because I get to be with him. Christianity is the most personal because he is the bread of life. He is what we take into the center of our being that makes us alive. I'm going to invite the ushers, if you would. Ushers, would you guys get ready to serve communion this morning? And while they're doing that, I'm just going to wrap up with this. Last thing as we prepare for communion this morning. Two questions, one that'll have to wait till next week and one we'll address this week. First question is, well, how do we receive the bread of life? And the second is, why can we receive the bread of life? How is it that people 
If Jesus is the divine son of God and the king who reigns over all, how can we, why does that even work? Why can we have a personal relationship with Jesus? Here's a preview of the first question. The first question was, how do we receive it? In verse 28 and 29, again, Jesus says, don't work for the food that spoils. Ushers, you guys can go ahead and start serving. Verse 27, don't work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life. And then Jesus said, then they say to Jesus, verse 28, well, what must we do? What is the work of God? So you don't want us hustling all over the place. What is the work of God? And Jesus answers in verse 29, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. In other words, the work of God is stop working, please. Stop the hustle and stop thinking you can save yourself. It's one of the hardest things to do. Because all you need to come to Jesus is nothing, right? We've talked, all you need is nothing and most people don't have that. The other question, and we're going to talk a lot more about that next week. But the other question, why is this even possible? Is because Jesus is not just the bread of heaven. He is the bread that was broken. The reason why we, we, we can receive him is because he was broken. Bread that's whole does you no good, <laughs> okay? You can smell it. Mm. You could lick it. I'm not going to do that. You could hold it. You could think about it. You could memorize its properties. You could talk to it in Latin and Greek. It does you no good. Bread only gives life when it's broken and you bring it in. That's the only time the bread works. So Jesus isn't just the bread of life. He's the bread that was broken for you. And when we share communion, Every time we do this, he has asked us to please remember this is the only reason why we can even have this conversation. He says, if you, if you were to still have your Bible open in, in chapter 6, verse 51, he says, we find it, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. That word for means in the place of. I give, Jesus says, my life for yours. I'm going to let you destroy me so that you might live. I'm going to let you devour me in some sense so that you would be made alive. And that's what we remember every time we share this meal together. So I'm just going to give you a minute right now on your own just to prepare your hearts for sharing this meal together. And then we'll do it together in just a minute, okay? Okay.